All right. Upper resp anything on UTIs? Okay. Upper respiratory tract. Here we're talking nose, sinuses, um, um, trachea, this sort of thing. Usually it's not useful to culture, especially the nose and the sinus, because you're going to find just about er everything. Okay. So instead, um, we'll oftentimes use cytology and biopsy. Now the exception to that might be a surgical approach. If you actually open up a sinus uh, surgically, then certainly go ahead and take a culture at that point because you're bypassing the upper uh, nasal area that's contaminated when you go in surgically. But just sampling through the nose is not uh, likely to be very uh, worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> upper respiratory, kennel cough, canine infectious tracheobronchitis is due to Bordetella. Uh, this is one of those examples where we don't necessarily always use antibiotics. Uh, it, it's kind of, as they say, like the, the, the human cold. It, it gets better in uh, two weeks if you treat it and 14 days if you don't. Uh, so, uh, largely I'm using antitussives and I may uh, steam vaporize the room um, periodically or use a nebulizer, but largely I don't use antibiotics on a routine basis. <clears throat> now if you're going to use them, and medically that should be because you're concerned about it progressing into a pneumonia, realistically there's a lot of pressure on you from an owner to do something. Okay, it's kind of like the same scenario. The mother has the child with a cold or otitis externa and wants antibiotics. Uh, is it always warranted? Probably not. But if you're going to use it, at least use the right thing. And unlike in food animals that have seen a lot of antibiotics, Bordetella in small animals and Pasteurella in small animals have not. So different things will work, but typically our drug of choice is doxycycline in adults. Okay, um, <clears throat> it's usually susceptible and it penetrates into the bronchial fluids very well. Puppies um, doesn't penetrate quite as well, but we would probably opt for Clavamox as an alternative. Some clinicians will nebulize aminoglycosides, uh, trying to get it into the lower airway there. Uh, so we'll take amicacin or cobramycin or one of those and use a nebulizer. Uh, to try to get it uh, a local effect. Now, crossed out there are intratracheal injections. It's a fairly common practice for veterinarians in some of these to uh, take a 3cc syringe and they'll draw up some aminoglycoside and some dexamethasone and inject it between the tracheal rings. And the idea it sounds good because you're, you're getting supposedly a very high concentration locally. All right. Uh, the reason it's crossed out is the science doesn't support that. Uh, when they've studied this, what they find is that the drug gets routed into the healthy lung, not into the diseased lung, okay, or the bronchi. Uh, they did a study in CAS where they added fluorescine dye, fluorescine fluoresces under UV light, and then they uh, um, did the intratracheal injection. They necropsied them, showed the UV light, and also did concentrations. And basically, the healthy lung fluoresced like crazy, but the diseased lung didn't. It just doesn't go into the diseased tissue. So I'm not going to say you're wrong to do it, I'm just saying the science doesn't back you up. I truthfully think an intratracheal injection is a lot like giving uh, an IM injection. All right, It's going to go systemically from the healthy lung. And when they've looked at uh, concentrations, basically the concentrations reflect those in plasma. And I always get dirty looks from practitioners when I tell them that because they really like to do the intratracheal injections. Okay. Uh, I added this slide. Um, bronchitis is not a, a common finding per se in dogs uh, and even less so in cats uh, outside of kennel cough, but it does occur. 
particularly if there's an underlying disease. Probably where we see it most often is uh, secondary bronchitis in a small breed with a collapsing trachea or a brachiocephalic breed with uh, tracheal um, uh, stenosis, then uh, we may see a, a bronchitis. Not all of these are infectious, some are inflammatory, uh, but uh, if you get one, then uh, go ahead and base your selection on culture and sensitivity and cytology, okay? Uh, so we're doing a BAL, a transtracheal wash, something like that. A variety of antibiotics uh, can work in this regard, uh, so no clear choice. A reminder, uh, because these are often dogs with chronic respiratory conditions, a lot of them, and this is cats too, with feline asthma, okay, so they're often on bronchodilators. And one of the bronchodilators that they're on is the offline. And remember, the fluoroquinolones and chloramphenicol are enzyme inhibitors, and you can wind up with a theophylline toxicity if you don't back off the dose. So anytime you're, you've got an animal on theophylline, be careful which antibiotic you put it on. If it's one of these two, you're going to have to adjust the theophylline dose. Ideally, all uh, theophylline and therapeutic drug monitoring, but uh, arbitrarily, we reduce the dose 30 to 50%. Okay, feline upper respiratory, okay, is mostly viral, okay. You get the sick kitty cat with upper respiratory, it's usually either Khaleesi or herpes, all right. Now, a small portion are chlamydia. It varies by region and by country. The last I saw in the U.S., chlamydia incidence was somewhere between 5 and 10%. So not really high, but if you were to practice in uh, Great Britain, in the UK, it's up to 50%. So it depends on the uh, location and your, your local uh, distribution patterns. <coughs> um, a lot of these, the tip off on a lot of these is they'll have a conjunctivitis. Uh, chlamydia typically um, uh, attacks the conjunctiva as well as the other upper respiratory tissue. But confounding that, remember, herpes also attacks the eye, more the cornea than the conjunctiva. But if you think you've got uh, chlamydia, then in the cat, um, probably Clavamox has replaced doxycycline just because of the safety and acceptance. Uh, but uh, either would work in, in terms of the, uh, the actual disease. Again, antibiotics only from a systemic standpoint, um, other than chlamydia would be, as, again, if it's progressing into a pneumonia. And in the cat, they're most likely to have a pastorella. Cats have pastorella as part of their normal flora in their oropharynx, so they oftentimes will get pastorella when they uh, develop a pneumonia. But again, uh, these pastorella are not like bovine pastorella. They haven't seen very many drugs, so a whole variety of things will work uh, on this. Now, I've mentioned nasal aspergillosis several times. Uh, we, we don't know why, but German shepherds in particular will get nasal aspergillosis, okay? And as alluded to there, we don't culture because you're, you're very likely to culture aspergillus from a normal nose, okay? It's just out in the environment. Uh, instead, what you want to do is biopsy, and here we see a little fungal ball of hyphae right there that we would be biopsying. That would confirm our diagnosis, okay? Uh, it has been uh, historically very difficult to treat. People have tried various systemics, not uh, to any great benefit. Again, now voriconazole has come along. We really don't know how well it would work. It should work. Uh, the reason we don't know how well it works is people mostly are doing these topicals here, 
okay? So it's kind of cool what they're, they're doing, and they're using either enalconazole or clotrimazole. Enalconazole is a poultry antifungal, uh, and uh, clotrimazole, I mentioned, is in a lot of otic preparations for the yeast, but you can buy it as a separate powder. Okay, um, both are too toxic for systemic use, but what we do is, is uh, this, okay? So you anesthetize the dog and you intubate it, all right, blow off the cuff, and then you pack the back of the uh, pharynx with gauze. Even though you've got the endotracheal tube cuff, this stuff is really irritating if it reaches the trachea and they'll get a bad, bad tracheitis uh, and if it slips too far in aspiration pneumonia. So this is a double uh, safeguard, the cuff plus packing off the back of the pharynx. And then we take a Foley catheter and run it through the mouth and wrap it around to where we're under the soft palate. So, and then we uh, um, blow up the bulb. So we're occluding the back of the soft palate. So we're blocking off the nasopharynx from the posterior side. And then we take a catheter and run it into the nose. And then another Foley catheter uh, to occlude the nostrils. All right, so basically we've taken the nasal sinus area and occluded it at the end and at the beginning and then we infuse the drug through the catheter and we just fill that whole area up with antifungal. And every 15 minutes you rotate the dog 90 degrees. All right, so it's, you know, like a rotisserie. All right. <laughs> So you're trying to distribute uh, this uh, over the course of an hour, and then you, uh, after the hour, you drain as much fluid as you can. You get them sternal, et cetera, and, and the, and the um, success rate is surprisingly high on this. So it's it's a, a good technique to use for nasal aspergillosis. All right. Now, uh, pneumonia in dogs and cats, really there are no specific etiologies, unlike in food animals. Um, usually it's secondary to other things, um, particularly aspiration pneumonias uh, are what we see a lot of here. <coughs> but um, here you see a whole variety of bacteria that can be involved. Again, pasturella is always on the list with cats. But really, you need to get an etiology if you can, okay? And here I run into uh, a little headbutting some of the time. If it's mild, the clinician doesn't want to do the culture. If it's severe, they're afraid to do uh, the anesthesia to get the sample. Uh, so. Uh, but having the sample, knowing what you're treating and the susceptibility is really, really important for all the reasons I spoke about yesterday. What I will try to get them to do is instead of doing a BAL, do a transtracheal wash. All right, BAL, a bronchial alve alveolar lavage, is of course where you anesthetize the dog and you run a sterile endoscope down the trachea and you're visualizing the trachea and the bronchi and you can take your brush and get cytology and you can inject saline and get a, uh, your sample for cytology and culture. That's the gold standard, but you have to anesthetize the dog. <coughs> uh, what I think students don't see enough of here is transtracheal washes. Um, <clears throat> the, the internists love their toys, so they like to use endoscopes any time, chance they get. But you can do a transtracheal wash under sedation. It doesn't have to be anesthetized. You can sedate the dog, take about an 80-inch jugular catheter, and, and uh, go through the, uh, is it the cricothyroid ligament right up here. You can go between the tracheal rings, but I think it's uh, the cricothyroid ligament point it down, thread the catheter through, remove the needle, and then take about 30 cc's of sterile saline and inject it through that catheter into, it'll be down in the distal bifurcation, as rapidly as you can, and as soon as you get it um, all injected, you immediately pull back and try to suck out some of that fluid again. Now, you're only gonna get two or three mils, 
but with a little luck, uh, two or three meals is enough. You'll have mucus and all the cytology and bacteria, so you can submit it for culture and you can submit it for cytology. And you don't have to worry about the 28 mils that stayed down there. That's not going to drown the dog. It's absorbed benignly, uh, and they do fine. So a transtracheal wash is a much more benign way of getting your culture. The other way that uh, uh, some uh, will do it, I've talked with them, and some do it anyway, and some I promote it. You can take propofol and do a real quick knockdown. So uh, propofol them, put in a sterile endotracheal tube, and then run your male dog catheter down and do a, a, a lavage that way to get your sample, or you can even take a uh, uh, mere uterine um, swab and run it down and get a, uh, a sample that way. So anytime you can get the sample on a pneumonia so you know what you're dealing with, you're way, way better off. Okay. Uh, <coughs> a variety of antibiotics are gonna work in a pneumonia. Normally we don't worry about obligate anaerobes unless it's an aspiration pneumonia. Now aspiration pneumonias, especially if they're associated with a chemical injury, uh, then they're really uh, more likely to get a mixed infection, including obligate anaerobes. So there I'm going to err a little bit more on the side of four quadrant when it's an aspiration pneumonia. Uh, like I say, anything with the right spectra will work. Now the longer it goes, where you get more consolidation and more abscessation, then the more lipid soluble, better penetrating drugs may have an advantage. But early on, just about anything with the right um, <coughs> coverage will work. Okay. And in life threatening, uh, four quadrant, also in aspirations until we get a culture and sensitivity back. One of the nastiest pneumonias you'll deal with is uh, pulmonary necardiosis. Uh, we don't know how the nocardia gets in there, but if you read the literature, a lot of times it's associated with a migrating on. So uh, a thorn, a stick, uh, something like this. Oftentimes we presume it penetrates the esophagus and migrates into the pleural chest cavity. We oftentimes don't know, but uh, if you're for any reason doing an exploratory in one of these, look for an on. Oftentimes they're found on uh, necropsy. Now trimethoprim sulfa TMS is our drug of choice. Okay, here. Uh, other things, chest tubes are you're usually going to have to place. So they oftentimes have a lot of pleural effusion and it is gross pleural effusion. I mean it is pus with fibrin and everything hanging out of it. So we have two kinds of chest tubes. We have these nice little thin, easily placed chest tubes that look like IV catheters. Those are fine for uh, aspirating air in a pneumothorax or an effusion uh, <coughs> in the pleural cavity like a chylothorax but they will clog up every time with this sort of thing. There's just too much fibrin and, and uh, gunk in there. So here we take really big chest tubes with uh, large perforations and we put them in usually bilaterally to draw off this, okay? Uh, again, you don't have to know the dose, but uh, 30 mg per kg of TMS is the label dose once a day. When I use it for routine things, I do it BID. For pulmonary nocardiosis, I'm going at least TID, if not QID at that dose. Because of all that pus and uh, debris, I've got to overcome a lot of the binding and inactivation. So I really hit them with a very aggressive dose. Now when you do so, you're also much more prone to see the bone marrow suppression, the type A adverse reaction from the trimethoprim. So you want a baseline and then periodic CBC and platelets to make sure you're not getting bone marrow suppression. Again, you can reverse this with folinic acid, not folic acid, but folinic acid. Uh, what we typically did was we monitored the CBC and platelets and added the folinic acid when we saw uh, leukopenia starting to occur or thrombocytopenia. 
now, uh, unless things have changed recently, the folinic acid is generic and not that expensive, so I'm almost prone to just give them the folinic acid from the get-go. Because you're talking, treating this a long time, at least six weeks of treatment, oftentimes several months of treatment in uh, trying to resolve this. Okay, now if for some reason they can't tolerate the TMS, uh, uh, you can use a sulfonamide. Now that still doesn't help with the cat. The cat won't tolerate either the TMS or the sulfa. Then you go doxycycline or minocycline would be your next best choice there. Uh, a beta-lactam, amoxicillin would be an option, but there's more resistance to the amoxicillin than there are the tetracyclines. So I would say in that order, TMS, a tetracycline, and then a beta-lactam. Right. But really severe disease, difficult to treat, uh, often hospitalized for long periods of time, chest tube drainage, aggressive uh, dosing. Now, what about refractory pneumonias? Uh, things that should have cured, but they keep dragging on or relapsing. Things to remember, uh, mycoplasmal infections. Dogs and cats don't have a primary mycoplasmal pneumonia, unlike uh, cattle and swine and poultry, but it is a secondary invader. So when you get a pneumonia for some other reason, viral or bacterial, you can get mycoplasma coming in on top of it and complicating things. Now you can send off for mycoplasmal PCR if that's the case, but oftentimes I just make sure that I have used a drug that is effective against mycoplasma. And if I have not, then I'll uh, try that. And those would be the ones that you should recognize as having good activity against mycoplasma. Likewise, uh, you don't want to miss a fungal infection. There's been more than uh, the occasional veterinarian that is treating pneumonia and it's not responding and it's not responding because it's actually a blastomycosis instead of a bacterial pneumonia. Uh, now, if you've taken radiographs, you'll know that. But otherwise, bear it in mind, if they're not responding, make sure they don't have a fungal pneumonia uh, and rule out mycoplasma.